Welcome back, everyone, to Beyond the Helmet. I'm your host, Steve McGrath. And if you haven't already, you know I need to ask you to hit the like button, subscribe, leave a five-star review, anything to help to get the word out, because today I'm about to chop it up with the Cincinnati Bengal that's been there for nine years, patrolling the linebacker core, special teams guy, none other than Vincent Ray. Vinny, how are you doing today? Doing well, man. Glad to be on, Steve. Thank you for taking the time, man. I, we were just talking, of course, before we jumped on live, and I know you've been busy because the zone defense has been running a little thin on your end <laughs> with three kids running around. So, so, man, what's life been like for you as of late, just getting away from the game a little bit? It's been fun, man. Um, I'm full-time at home. I have a five-year-old, three-year-old, and a seven-month-old, all girls. So, you know, it's it's my wife. I have three daughters, and it's just me and uh, the fish, Slow Mover, which my daughter named him, Slow Mover. We're the only boys in this in this house, man. So, uh, but but I'm enjoying it, man. I'm enjoying kind of being retired from football and, uh, or not kind of, but being retired from football and just enjoying life. So from what I understand though, your time as a player may have come to an end, two seasons now removed, but it- from what I'm hearing, maybe there's a still a future with you being a member of the Cincinnati Bengals organization. <clears throat> yes. So I just recently, and you, you'll, you're first to know. Uh, so I recently have become the chaplain for the Bengals. Uh, the former chaplain, his name is Lamoris Crawford. He was there eight years, and he was. I I had the chance to be uh, under him and uh, walk with him for six years and it was a great time. He really, really helped. Um, He's married, he has four children. He's very much a leader and he's a follower of Christ also. And that's uh, just somebody to model after. He was a servant beyond anything. He wanted to always serve, always adding value in all he did. And that's something as as a man, as a father, as a husband. And at when I was, in the NFL, as an NFL player, that's something that is very important to be able to serve. Um, it doesn't matter what position you are, everyone has a job to do, and that's the way you serve. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for Lamoris, and I'm, I'm excited to step into this role to be an outlet for the players. You know, we have, when I played, we had like uh, sports psychologists, we had a uh, a head of security. We had different people who you can go to if you had issues um, so that your off the field issues were fine. So you can be, y- your ability to perform on the field was maximized. And I'm just looking to be one of those outlets, man. Um, spiritually, uh, also a guy to just speak to. I, I have played before in the NFL and I have played for this franchise. So, so oh, just to be another uh, shoulder, shoulder to lean on, uh, another person to speak to. And ultimately, I, I want to, um, you know, disciple people, lead people into a relationship with, with the Lord. And those who, who, don't, who desire that, that's what I, I'm there for. But I'm also there for other things also. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited to be back in that building. Yeah, you know, obviously, I've known you now for all of a couple minutes. But when I, I just just saying that though, I would imagine that you have a love of the game. You did it for so long, and then to now match that with a, your faith, which is obviously a huge part of you, is like this has to be close to a dream job. Yeah, it really is because the thing I love uh, uh, so was just kind of leading young men. Um, in general, just leading young men. So in the NFL, once you get to about your third year in, you are like, for me, I was a veteran. I was a leader at that point. My fourth year, I was a captain, special teams captain. So you're young, you're 24 or 25, but at the same time, you're a leader. And I enjoyed leading um, young men. And, and, you know, it's, you win someone, you lose somebody, you're trying to win more than you lose. And um, now I get that opportunity to be a leader, to uh, to be a servant. And the best leaders are the, one, the ones who serve the most. Uh, so I'm excited, man. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm so happy for you because, again, it, it seems like a, a perfect opportunity for you to stay connected with the game, use your faith to help you, some of the younger guys or, and older guys alike. But you hadn't been with the team for a couple of years, and, and sometimes it's not a big deal. But in those two years, man, new coach, new quarterback, a lot of new faces, but A.J. Green isn't there. I mean, we got some of the, the all-time you know, favorite Bengals that are, are no longer there. What's it going to be like for you trying to mesh back into this new group of faces? Well, you know, I'm coming in there with no expectations. Uh, you know, I'm not looking for people to look to me for think related. I'm coming there to be a helping hand. I'm coming there to be an outlet for the players or the coaches or anyone in that building. So I'm, I'm really coming in there to serve, but I've, I tell you what, I, I've been a fan of the Bengals uh, since I've been done since maybe 2019, the last couple of years. And, um, you know, I, you see, you really get to see how the team changes, uh, not only coaches, but even players. I've only been gone um, two years, maybe going into my third year, I'm out. And most of the players, I don't even know who they are. I've never, never met them before. But that's really a, the nature of the game. Uh, there's a lot of turnover in this league, and it's hard to stick. And, uh, you know, a lot of people know the, the names of the guys who play double-digit seasons, but those are few and far in between. Most guys, uh, the average career, I believe, is around three years, and most guys are just fighting to stay every week. Just like, I mean, myself, I was an undrafted player, and I was fighting every week to stay because weekly people were being cut and new guys were being added. Yeah. I, I mean, it, 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 can you hear me? Okay. Is my audio all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes it comes in a little fuzzy on my end. So I just want to make sure you can hear me. Um, you know, it's a, what you just said is a perfect segue because you, you're right. You did fight, you know, week in, week out for so many years to, to make it. So I actually wanted to, you know, if we can jump back to 2009, right? We got this young guy, all conference from Duke, four years there. What was it like for you just being that guy who goes undrafted, has to earn every, you know, just phone call just to maybe get invited uh, to a team after you don't get drafted? How did you go from, I guess, maybe humbling yourself, being the, one of the top guys at Duke, to now being an undrafted guy in the NFL? How did you sort of flip that switch? And ultimately, what's that first year like with Cincy just trying to make the practice squad? Wow. So, um, yeah, end of 2009, I was the end of my senior year. And going into the 2010 NBA, NFL, I said NBA, <laughs> NFL draft, uh, I I didn't have any expectations of getting drafted. It mainly because at Duke we weren't uh, you know we weren't winning games as now that they've been a school that we've become more of a school that we go to bowl games most years uh, we're more successful but back then we weren't and um, I remember watching the draft especially the third day rounds four through seven. Uh, watching it at, at my house with my parents and thinking, man, like these are some guys here getting drafted at linebacker. I think I can do just as good of a job, maybe even better. I think my stats were just as good as theirs, maybe even better. But, uh, you know, I just was hoping for a shot, hoping for a chance. And on draft day, like maybe uh, five minutes after the draft ended, I received a call from the Cincinnati Bengals and they wanted to bring me in as a linebacker. And I was grateful because even though I was going to be one of 80 or one of 90 guys on the roster and they were only going to keep 53, I still had a shot, you know? So uh, as, as some, as some players, some coaches say, uh, as an undrafted player, your, your leash is a lot shorter than the other players. Some guys are guaranteed to make the roster and as an undrafted player, Man, it, it's, it may be 20 guys competing for two or three spots. And that was tough. Uh, every day um, was a competition. And I was told before I got in the NFL, right before I got in, I was told by a former player that you are being evaluated before you even step foot 
on the field. You're being evaluated by how you interact with other players. You're being evaluated by how you interact with coaches, with management, with your average worker at the stadium who uh, maybe security or uh, lunch uh, in the lunchroom. You're always being evaluated. And I was thankful I learned that. Um, So little things such as being early, um, taking notes, being focused, um, those little things, they're very, very little, but when you do the little things well, they add up to something significant. And everything, I was just competing with myself in anything I did. I realized being early to the special teams meetings, the coach was there with other players going over what he was going to go over in the meeting. So I would get there early and I'm hearing him going over it with the with the players who were veterans. So I'm listening in and then the, the team, the meeting starts and he goes over everything all over, which for me, it just cemented in my brain what I had to do. And when I get on the field, I don't have to make that first mistake, let alone a second mistake. So I know what to do. So then I can go out there and just do it and just play fast. And doing those little things day by day, even though I I initially was cut and I was on a practice squad, the next day they put me on uh, 12 weeks, I believe, uh, on a practice squad. Um, I I was able to move up on the roster at at one point in December at later in the season. And thankfully, I had been living with a guy named Dahani Jones who played 11 years in the NFL, um, linebacker just like myself, very successful. Uh, And Dahani, on Tuesday nights, he will go in maybe 7, 8 p.m., maybe 9 p.m. He's going into the uh, on the second floor where the coaches met at, and he's getting the game plan. And I'll go in with him. I'll get the game plan on defense. I'll um, hear the game plan for special teams. And I'm preparing as if I would play from week one. So week by week, as the weeks go, as the weather's getting colder, I still prepared as if I was going to play. And that really helped me because once my opportunity came, I was prepared and I was able to be successful with my snaps on the field. They started very few, very few snaps, but I was, I was successful with there and um, I was faithful with the little. So I got more, more opportunity. And um, I tell you what, from that first game um, lining up to play, I think it was against the Chargers at home on Christmas day. Uh, that first game, my first time strapping up and I had, you know, over a hundred games later, I, I, I continued to play, continued to compete. It, that's awesome. Um, do you think you make it without Donnie Jones? I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I think, um, I think it would be t- tougher. I'm not going to say that I wouldn't have, but it would have been significantly tougher because he was a great model of how to practice. Uh, we had a coach, a coordinator, uh, Coach Coach Zimmer, uh, Coach Mike Zimmer, and Zim, he, he's now a head coach with the Vikings. I believe he's a very good defensive mind. And he, uh, in training camp, is one of those dog days. He's really getting on us. We're tired. We have, this is back in the time with two a days. And I, that is the hardest thing I had been through. Just, that's an aside. The hardest physical thing I've ever been through in my life was a two a day in the NFL. But uh, one day, the, um, coach just calls out Dahani and he's like, Coach Zim's like, Dahani, what? Your, your knees hurt. You have a hurt knee. I see you in, tra- in, the, in the training room every day. Why do you keep practicing? And Dahani said, Because I don't want anyone to take my spot. And Coach Zim said, look at that. He's paranoid. We need some more more paranoid guys around here. I'll never forget it. And I'll never forget he said that. And I'm like, wow, he, here's a guy who's in his 11th season. He's an accomplished guy. I believe he won a Super Bowl when he was on the, uh, on, he didn't win a Super Bowl. He went to the Super Bowl when he was with the New York Giants. And I'm like, this guy's very accomplished, man. He, he's done well for himself on the field, off the field, but he's still not missing a practice <laughs> at, while you had guys 10 years younger than him missing practice. And it just showed me 
if he is doing it at that standard, I need to do it at that standard every day also. So um, a lot of time as, as people more is caught than taught, um, you, you learn things um, from people rather than someone just teaching you A, B, and C. And I caught a lot from him and I'm thankful. I love that more caught than taught. Now, that, that just lays the foundation for how you go from practice squad guy, barely making it to invaluable linebacker that maybe th was thought of as a backup, but you're ultimately a starter at different spots. Like you are... You're, you're, just, you're everywhere. They can't not have you on the field because you, you work yourself into that position. So um, the, the, the Honey Jones part aside, what are your thoughts on how you basically up your game for four or five years to, to be that guy? How, how do you go from that guy just clinging on to being like, you're the special teams captain and oh, by the way, you're, you're now a starter on defense. You're an invaluable part of the team. Man, hmm. that's a good question, man. <laughs> So uh, I'll tell you this, uh, being on uh, the look, like the little things that everyone can do, I tried my best every day to do them better than everyone else. And one, one special thing about the NFL is that most of your, most of the time you're not on the field. Most of the time from Monday through Saturday, you're in meeting rooms and Half the time when you're on the field, you're not even going full speed. You're doing, we may have a, a, a job, a walkthrough, a walkthrough for an entire hour. We'll have a jog through for maybe 20 minutes to a half hour when I, we had, when I was playing. Sometimes I talk in the present tense, sorry. <laughs> but um, those times are unbelievable opportunities to get better. And as a backup player, the um, one of the most important things that any any player can whether you're yeah let's just talk about football but any NFL player any people trying to get in the NFL anyone trying to stay on if you're in training camp um, I think one of the one of the most important things you can do is this pay attention and get mental reps there's something we call the mental rep a mental rep mental rep is watching the guy in front of you at your position when he's in and pretend like that's you and see exactly what he does. And when he does something that you don't understand, ask a question. Because as a young player, the NFL, these coaches, they're not trying as much, in my opinion, this is my opinion here, I don't think they're trying to develop you as an undrafted player as much because they just, not because they're bad people, they just don't have the time to develop you. They're trying to focus on the players who they're expecting to play the bulk of the, of the snaps that season. So if you're a coach, you're trying to win. If I'm trying to win, I'm trying to develop the players who want to play the most. I'm not worried about the, the younger players or the undrafted players. So when you're, you're a young guy or young drafted, you have to look at those starters at your position and see what they do because they may get, they may get 30 full speed reps, 20, 20 mental, 20 jog through reps, 20 walk through reps. So that's 70 reps that the guy in front of you got. You may only get a total of 10 reps, if that. So that guy got 70, you got 10. If you're not paying attention to that guy and you're on the sideline during that time, just laughing, joking, looking around, not paying attention, you just miss 70 reps. So you can get those reps if you watch every time. Then you're watching. You know what he did right when you would have done something else. You know what he did wrong when you would have did right. So you're actually getting better during those, during those mental reps. And I know I'm kind of going on here. And it seems like it, this is something trivial, but this is gold mental reps are gold and it's important to not just get the rep watching him on the field but when you get in the meeting room now you're watching again now you can ask coach a question now you can ask the, that player a question that is something that made me better because I wasn't getting those uh, repetitions my first year or even my first couple years but watching the guy in front of me every rep he got was a rep for me mentally and it made me better. And as, to your point, 
when my time did come uh, to play on defense, I excelled because I didn't mess up because I knew what to do. That's half of the battle, doing your job, knowing what to do. And also just uh, credit to my coaches, they, that we had great players on defense. So I didn't have to be Superman. I just had to do my job, you know? If it's run and I have to defend a be shock and shed. If it's pass and I have this man man, I have a man to man inside leverage, I'm gonna play a man to man inside leverage. I'm gonna look at that hip. I'm not looking back at the quarterback until I'm in phase and I'm right next to him. You know, I'm gonna all I have to do is do my job because when I was playing, I had we had excellent rushers that were doing their job and getting to the quarterback. We had ex excellent corners and safeties doing their job as defenders. So I just had to play my part. So you did that, but you also did it at multiple positions. How hard was it for you to understand? You, everything you said makes perfect sense for, I watched that guy. How did you watch three? Yeah. <laughs> that, now that, um, how I started doing that was my my coach started, if there was an injury in practice, he would put me to a different linebacker position. So I came in, I was a will linebacker, weak side linebacker. He put me maybe to middle linebacker. And if there was an injury at strong side or, you know, he, some guys wanted to rest that day, he say, okay, you'll get four reps at strong side linebacker. So I'm getting those repetitions. Then I'm learning, I'm learning that way. And this at some points, because I eventually learned that will linebacker, that weak side linebacker position. So I'll see, okay, we're playing quarters coverage. It's, it's past, we're playing seven on seven. Let me see what the Sam linebacker is doing. Oh, if he's playing vertical hook te technique. Let me see how he plays it. Okay, number two goes up, number one comes under. He stayed up, he didn't come off the, off the uh, he didn't come off, you know, he stayed up. He didn't come off on the in route. Was he right there? Let me ask him. Then let me ask coach and let me hear their different reasonings and let me come up with my own uh, idea. So I started looking at other positions. Then um, I started, I would stay, I would watch film. It, I mean, I, at the time I wasn't married. I didn't have any children. I'm like, hey, why not stay? Why not compete with myself? Why not see how good I can be at the, in this game? So I would stay every day and I watch film and I'm watching all three linebacker positions and I'm just learning um, even though I wasn't playing those other two I'm just learning and then when the time came in practice I, I went in there and I did my job without anyone having to tell me what to do and coaches um, from my experience coaches really want someone who's reliable um, they would take someone who's more steady over someone who's up and down. And I was more of a steady guy. You know, th there were some guys who were more talented than me, faster, stronger, taller. I was usually the shortest linebacker on the roster, uh, but I knew what I had to do. And knowing, your, knowing what to do, it enables you to play a half step faster than what you really are. So do you ever get to a certain point where you're like, okay, Perfect is going to get suspended for at least a couple games this season. I got to make sure that I at least know his spot. Well, with Vontez, he, wait, okay. I remember in 2014 when he had a, he had an injury and he couldn't play some games. So it's like, man, Vontez was, I mean, we had a good, good linebacking core. Vontez was really the, he was the guy, you know, and he's not out there. We need someone to step up and make these plays. He was making a whole lot of tackles. And sometimes tackles get, um, in the NFL, I think they get, they get underappreciated sometimes. But it's hard to make a lot of these, a lot of tackles. Got, some guys making 100 plus tackles a, a season, that's very hard to do uh, on your body. So, I was, I was like, you know what? I have to step up and I need to make these plays while he's out. And, um, you know, he had injuries in some games. You know, he's a very physical player. 
and some games he would, you know, they said, Hey, that level of physicality, we're not playing, we're not doing that anymore. And he was, I remember one game he was um, ejected when we played in Tennessee. And at that time I was uh, in that game, my role that game was to play maybe uh, a few snaps, maybe like if we had 50 snaps, just play 25 on defense and then special teams. So I was special teams and defense. But when he went out, I went to full time on defense and full time special teams. And that really like that was tough. So, you know, whether it was him missing games or other guys at linebacker missing games, you have to be ready for sudden changes. Definitely. Uh, and, you know, yeah. I, I'm glad like, you brought the special teams part up because you, I don't think you get that shot at linebacker if you're not a special teams ace. So, I, of course, the entire time you're, you're thinking linebacker, you're taking those mental reps as you get, you know, you're, you're cut your teeth in the league, you know, 2010, 2011. But how, you know, what process did you have to go through in order to completely embody being the best special teams guy that you could be? Because I, I know you, you go in there with an, an ego of being a top performing collegiate athlete. Did you have to say, OK, I'm going to take a step back. This is what I have to do in order to secure my future in the NFL. Well, well, it didn't go like that for me because at Duke, I had a special teams coach who now, he, I believe he's coaching for the Jaguars, or he was, um, Coach Ron Middleton. He played 10 years in the NFL, and I was grateful to, be, to play for him in college for two years. And I was on kickoff. I was on punt as the starter on defense. So I was already... I played two phases on special teams in college. So it was important to me then. And I, I knew from talking with him, him who had played 10 years in the NFL, I spoke with another coach on, on uh, who was a coach teams was going to be my key to sticking on the roster. Um, I wasn't going to, you know, you're not just going to go there and say, Hey, I'm just, playing linebacker as an undrafted player, you have to show that you can uh, make plays on special teams. You can go make you no know, tackles in space. And we had a loaded special teams roster, man. I got to say, uh, Cedric Pierman, he was That's probably right. the best special teams player I, I, I ever played with. I'm not just saying that just because he's a, he's my good friend, but you know, the guy goes to the Pro Bowl uh, and you know, there's only one guy in the whole AFC uh, who goes to the Pro Bowl for special teams. It's him. And he, yeah, he's, I, I watched him just, the other teams, they're trying to double team him on, on kickoff and they just couldn't do it, man. He was just, he was just riding a high at that time with it. He, he was playing at such a high level. It, it, it wouldn't have been done even if they'd done well. <laughs> so, um, it's yeah, playing special teams. It started that way, but once I got my opportunity on defense, I knew what to do, and I played fast and I did my job. Now, so ultimately, what do you think separated you? Because, like you said, maybe it was twenty guys vying for one or two spots, and year after year, that same you know, new class of guys come in fighting for that one or two spots. Much like, you know, Dahani Jones in year 11, not, you know, being paranoid. What separated you from every other guy trying to latch on and be the next you? Why was it that you were able to do it and so many guys fail at trying to, I mean, it feels like they just, at the end of the day, they either just, they didn't try hard enough. Like they didn't focus on the details. That to me is what, what jumps out is how so many guys could not do it, but what stands up from the guys that do make the cut? Yes, um, I wouldn't say, I definitely would not say that players are, um, who didn't make the NFL or who didn't stick on a team for a, you know, longer than a few years, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they didn't try hard enough, not at all. Um, it's so competitive in this league. It's so hard even to make a full year on a roster. That is hard. Because the nature of the business, they're always looking, when I say they, I mean the coaches, the scouting department, you have scouts who scout just college. So every year they're bringing in new players, 
to replace you from college, a younger ver version of you. Um, you have NFL scouts who are every year looking for other teams, guys who play your position to replace you, to make an upgrade. And I liken it to uh, the movie, uh, the movie I, I like, uh, my kids like it, to Toy Story. Uh, you know, you had Woody. Woody was Andy's favorite. He was like the cowboy looking toy. And uh, he was Andy's favorite toy. But then all of a sudden, Buzz Lightyear gets there. And Woody, he's number two now. He's not the favorite. So every year, there's a new Buzz Lightyear coming in. And you have to show why you are important, why you, you deserve to stay. And um, I, I will say two things. One, uh, health, health on the field. There's so many things you can't control. And from my first game in the NFL, my rookie year, uh, until 2017, until my eighth year, I played nine in total, but until my eighth year, I never missed a game. So I was healthy enough to play in every game um, for that stretch. So some of it is it, just being available. You, know, you have to be available. You have to be able to withstand, you know, the rigors of a game, the rigors of even an NFL week. And thank, some things you are, are just not in your control. And I'm thankful that I was able to withstand that. But I will also say, the ability to persevere, man, is something else. Uh, and mentally, it can really become a drain for, hey, everything, nothing else matters. All that matters is that I get great sleep, I eat properly, and I drink enough water or Gatorade, and my mind is focused to be as great as I can be in walkthrough, jog through, practice, and a game. Mentally, you have to be 100% focused all the time. Or for me, that, that was my standard. And that's really hard to do because consistency is probably the hardest thing to do in life. Um, and it was really hard. It took a lot of mental fortitude, but thank the Lord I had, I had mental fortitude. And sometimes I wavered, but uh, the, like the mental, in camp it's easy to go there be hyped be excited man i can't i can't wait to get out here and make play some football make some plays but how about day 21 do you still have that excitement and it's hard to do it it's very hard but um, i think i like i like to say that i was able to have that mental fortitude to just zoom focus and only focus on football and focus on getting better yeah that, that, that's awesome but how much of this is forged in high school going two hours to and from just, just to play a game? I mean, I feel like <laughs> some of this might have been set from an early, a fairly early age. Yeah, man. Uh, from age 13, 14, going into high school, I, uh, I was looking for a school that had football. A lot of schools in New York City at that time didn't have football. So I'm, I'm from Queens, New York. And I, I chose to go to Bayside High School. It had a football tradition, a good football tradition. Didn't get into the Catholic schools, the private schools. Um, but in going to Bayside, it was, I had to take two trains and a bus every day to get to school. Um, I had to walk nine blocks to the bus stop every day to get to school. Uh, now, there are no snow days in New York, you know, in my time. So, a that that now to come to think of it a lot of that mental fortitude and that ability to keep on keeping on and to endure to persevere uh, it was built during those times not being late always being on time to school um getting student athlete of the year for my football team i had the highest gpa on the team even though i was traveling the farthest way um having to leave the house by what 550 every day to get to school for uh, on time. Yeah, it, it was very tough, but it more, more than paid off. <laughs> sure, sure <did. laughs> so, man, as we start to wind down, I, I just want to ask about Marvin Lewis. You, you know, the guy had been, um, had been with Cincy for so long. Uh, I, I've heard so many great things about him from, from different guys I've been able to speak to. 
you know, in, in your opinion, why was he able to have such a successful tenure in the NFL? I think, I, I think very highly of Coach Lewis. Uh, I think he has a great eye for talent. I'm not just saying that because he brought me in, <laughs> but I do think he has an extremely great eye for talent. Um, there was a, a point there we were bringing in, uh, uh, I was an undrafted rookie. Uh, Vontez Burfitt was an undrafted player. Um, there was a guy, a really good friend of mine to this day, his name's Emmanuel Lemur. He is, uh, he in college, he was like a safety linebacker. He went undrafted. And um, he didn't have, uh, no one signed him, but the Bengals brought him in as a tryout player. And he ends up playing seven or eight seasons in the NFL. Uh, so I think Coach Lewis has a great eye for talent. Also, he, he so I don't really know the intricacies here, but he obviously does well at developing coaches. Um, he has you know, his coaches go on to be head coaches. While I was there, um, Jay Gruden was there. He went on to be a head coach for Washington. Uh, Hugh Jackson goes on to be a head coach for Cleveland. Mike Zimmer goes on to be a head coach for Minnesota. And that's just uh, off the top. I, don't, I, I mean, there's other coaches who go on to be coordinators elsewhere. So he, he does a good job developing coaches and um, he's a great defensive mind himself. He is able to make complex things very simple um, on the defensive side of the ball. And then lastly, I'll say what I'll say about Coach Lewis is he really uh, he was really a part of the community. Every single year during the month of May or uh, May or June. Um, Every single, every single uh, student between first and eighth grade who was on the honor roll that year was able to come to the Cincinnati Zoo and meet the Bengals and meet the coaches and take pictures with us every year. So if you're on the honor roll, you lived in Cincinnati, you're getting an invite to the zoo to come take a, you know, meet Coach Lewis, meet the greats, you know, Chad Johnson, Terrell Owens, AJ Green. You're getting pictures with them. You're meeting with them. You're talking to them. And that was just one of the things he did. But I thought that was such a great way to get in touch with the city. And um, yeah, he's, I, there's not, you know, I can talk about him all day long, man. Great man. That's awesome. So, so a very similar follow-up question is, uh, under his tutelage, there was, you played on some great Bengals teams, and then there were years with, you know, you guys just weren't able to, you know, have those, you know, 10, 11, 12, one seasons. You know, what, what was the major distinguishing difference between the good years and the bad years? You know, outside of just talent, you know, sometimes guys come and go and there's a gap there. But, you know, considering that the coach was the same, a lot of the same guys year after year, you know, if you could put your finger on anything, what do you think it would be? Um, overall, I would say even with the, with the many win seasons, um, the seasons I've won multiple uh, AFC North titles. And this is during a time when Pittsburgh was really good. Baltimore was really good. I, we were winning the division. Um, ultimately, I think that uh, we needed more leadership from uh, us as players. Us as players should have been better leaders. That's what I think we were missing on those teams because um, to me, some of those years, we should have um, gone further in the playoffs than we did. Um, I never won a playoff game. You know, so I should have won some based on leadership from players, uh, from us. And I put myself in there also. We should, we should have led the team better. Um, I will say, though, some of those years we, we weren't making the playoffs, it's tough to continue to win when your coaches, your, the, your position coaches, linebacker coach, is going off to be a, a coordinator. At Miami, or your, you know, you have Coach Vance Joseph, who at one point he was a, a an assistant DBs coach. He eventually goes on to be a coordinator and then a head coach. Um, and there's other coaches, Coach Matt Burke, who I played for as a linebacker coach. He goes on to be a coordinator. 
there were many coaches who were going on to be coordinators elsewhere and then head coaches elsewhere. And it's tough when you have these good coaches leaving. And similarly, we had really good players that ended up leaving that we weren't able to keep um, because, you know, they just went on. I mean, it's business. Football is also business. You had other teams that valued them higher uh, and they just went elsewhere. I, I can start trying to name some of these players. Um, if I can, I, I'll tell you this. In 2015, we had a really good season. We were one of the best teams in the league. And after that year, we lose uh, guys like Marvin Jones at receiver, who's a really good player for us that year. Um, he goes on to, um, you know, I don't know how much he was paid or anything, but I'm, I'm sure he was highly paid to go somewhere else. You had Mo, Muhammad Sanu. Mo Sanu leaves that year. Um, also, Reggie Nelson, one of the best safeties in the league at that point, he leaves that year. Kevin Zeitler, uh, he goes on to, I believe, be the highest paid guard some, uh, in Cleveland that year. So that's four guys I just named right off the bat who left. Uh, Hugh Jackson left that year. It's so it, to continue winning and um, not, I mean, no slight also at other players, but I will say um, when I came in in 2010, I came in with the likes of Jermaine Gresham, uh, Geno Atkins, Carlos Dunlap. I came in with these guys the next year in that draft class, a, um, AJ Green, Andy Dalton, Clint Bowling, guys who, who played for the team many years and made plays. So um, having younger players come in and make plays, that's important. And I don't think some of our younger players, I don't, I think as the years went, I don't think they were coming in and making plays for us, um, in my opinion. But it, it's hard to keep winning. And there's, there's only a few that continue to do it. Maybe, what, three or four teams that continue to win every year. And those, those are the best teams that they're just well coached. They, they have great leaders as players. And also they continue to, um, you know, have good coaches or keep good coaches and continue to draft well. Definitely. Well, but before we get into the gauntlet, I, I have one last question for you. All right. Okay. The Bengals need a touchdown to win the game. Who's dropping back to throw the pass? Is it Andy Dalton or is it Carson Palmer? <laughs> Man, for me, it's Andy Dalton. I played, uh, what, eight seasons with him as the, as the start quarterback. Carson, when, when I played with Carson, we didn't have a good year. And, uh, you know, Andy, his first five seasons in the NFL, he, he leads us to the playoffs. So, uh, nothing, I know both of those guys. And, no, you know, that's just my opinion. I'm going with, uh, I'm going with Andy there. All right, well, he's going to throw the ball. So, is it Ocho Cinco that's catching it? Is it T.O. or is it A.J. Green? Uh, <laughs> man, it's A.J. A.J.'s catching the ball, man. Uh, I I'll tell you, I'll tell you something about AJ. I played eight years with him. Something that I bet no one outside the NFL really knows about him, unless you've you've been in the weight room with him. He's strong as an ox, super strong. He, uh, yes, squat. He squats heavier weight than me. Wow. Like, and he's six foot. What six foot four? He's a heavy squatter. I'm talking during the week. He's. I see him. I will, I'll see him in the weight room squatting four or five the day after the game we lift. He's squatting four plates, man. He's a bench press. Me and him probably bench the same amount of weight. Extremely strong guy. So uh, uh, you look at him and he looks so finesse, which he is. He's very, you know, does, you know, it looks, it looks all pretty when he's running the routes and stuff, but he, you know, he's not lacking on strength and power. That's interesting. Yeah, that you would be the first thing that comes to mind. But um, all right, man. I, I, well, I have like a two point conversion. Who are we going to run the ball to? I, I could have gone all day with, with, with the different guys, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to torch you, man. I, I do want to wrap this up, though, with what I call the gauntlet. A couple quick hitter questions, man. What's most important? Is it having the number one offense or the number one defense? And you asked me that question. You know, I'm biased, man. It's got to be number one defense. Uh, with, yeah. I think you're biased the right way. That's all I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, it, 
it's gonna it, hard to put you on the spot. So many memories, but if you had to pick one football memory that stands out to you, is there any or, or a couple maybe that are truly special to you? Yes, um, I I'll pick two. I had I, I'm um, I'm on defense. We're playing at home. It's like the first week uh, or second week of December in 2013. Um, we're playing against the Vikings. I'm coming on the field on third down and the Vikings, they have uh, Adrian Peterson, who I believe the year before won maybe what well, comeback play of the year, MVP or something. He, um, you know, was tearing the league up. They had a, a receiver slash return man named Cordell Patterson, who was a rookie who was tearing the league up. So we're going against these guys. They had a fullback who was a pro bowler. Um, and I come out there on third down. I drop back. I read uh, the quarterback's eyes and I intercept the ball and take it for a touchdown. And we ended up winning that game. And that clinched the AFC North, my first AFC North title. That was a great moment for me. Um, yeah, and another moment, it was uh, pretty surreal. It's fourth quarter. We're playing against the Chargers. We're playing at home. It's 2015, um, and um, we're uh, showing blitz. And uh, what's his name? Uh, I forget the quarterback. Uh, Rivers, quarterback. He's a uh, he's giving all these checks. He's blah blah blah. And I shift the defense. He doesn't have the time to check it, so he just takes the hike, and we get Carlos Dunlap running in there, you know, scot free for a sack. So those are probably my two favorite moments uh, that I can think of in the NFL. That's awesome. Uh, now, pregame, did you have a playlist that, that you had to you know, listen to any particular song before you went out in the field? One second. Sorry. Can you say that again? Yeah. Uh, uh, pregame, did you have a playlist, any particular song that you had to listen to before you went out on the field? No, uh, no, I didn't really listen to much, much music. I'm one of those rare guys. I didn't really listen much. But one song I loved hearing when I went on the field for pregame or was stretching, they would, pl they would play that song, uh, I Can Feel It. Um, it's called I Can Feel It, I think. I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sing it. I can, it's like an older song, man. It's like maybe '80s or something. Uh, yeah, it's a good song. All right, I'll have to Google it after here. It's not immediately jumping out to me. Okay. Um, all right, man. Players or scheme? Which is most important when it comes to winning? Absolutely, players. Uh, I had a coach that say it's not about the X's and O's. It's about the Jimmys and Joes. I've heard that before too. So, man, we've talked a lot, uh, a lot of great little tidbits here and there, but I want to end this on what's the best piece of advice that you'd give to a young student athlete, call it 16, 17, 18 year old kid that says, Hey man, how, how do I get there? How do I do what you've done? I would say, listen to your authority figures and mainly your coach. He's your authority figure. So listen to what they say and, have humility about yourself. Show humility by taking notes, um, not you know taking off your, your headphones and listening to every word the coach says, because when you do that, you're, um, you're showing that you can learn something from um, being on time and giving max effort all the time. But listening to your coaches, that's something that sounds simple, but some, some don't do it. And it's hard to listen all the time Sometimes you just want to do your own thing. But I say the, the, odds, the odds are always in your favor when you listen to these coaches because as a student athlete, a lot of the times your coach has been coaching longer than you've been alive. So just listen to your coach, man. Take what he says and do it 100 miles an hour. Well, there you have it. From not just a former near decade-long player in the NFL, but a the newest member of the Cincinnati Bengals, the Bengals team chaplain, Vincent Ray, Vinny, as we wrap it up, any place that you want to direct people to find you on social media or keep up with you? Man, um, so I have a, I have a 
Twitter now, but I, I think my old one got deleted. But yeah, you can search me, Vinny Ray, V I N N Y R E Y, to follow me there. And I think I'm on Facebook somewhere, but I'm not real big on social media. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're a man of mystery. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Vinny. I really appreciate it. No, thank you for your time. I appreciate it, Steve.